Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories Featuring Androids Selling Point by Norman Arqui Prisoner of War by Randall Garrett Imitation of Death by Lester Del Rey All the People by R. A. Lafferty Let's Get Together by Isaac Asimov Selling Point by Norman Arkowy Originally published in Imagination Stories of Science and Fantasy, December 1955 Narrated by Tom Tudor "'Good morning, madam,' Ira said. "'I represent—' "'We don't want any,' said the woman, easing the door shut. "'With a time-tested finesse of door-to-door -door salesmen, "'Ira slipped his size twelve shoe between the swinging door and the jam. "'But, madam, if you'll give me a few minutes of your time—' "'The woman shook her head. "'It won't do you any good,' she said, "'trying to squeeze the door shut over his foot. "'Whatever it is, we don't want any.' "'I represent U.S. Robot Company,' Ira persisted. He smiled pleasantly. His unyielding foot maintained a six-inch-wide avenue of communication between himself and the woman in the house. "'Long the leader in commercial industrial mechanicals, U.S. Robot is now introducing a new line of home servants designed to assist the housewife in every possible task about the house.' "'You're wasting your time,' the woman said wearily. Ira used his professional smile to indicate that he enjoyed wasting his time. "'When you've seen the demonstration,' he said, "'I'm sure you'll agree that no home should be without a Model 1 household robot.' The woman looked out at him silently, patiently, resigned. She was pretty and petite and very young, and from her appearance had never done the day's work in her life. A typical newlywed, Ira thought, a perfect prospect he decided. As you undoubtedly know, the outstanding characteristics of U.S. robot mechanicals have always been ability, durability, and reliability. Their performance in industry has earned for the United States Robots Company the enviable reputation it is proud to possess. Leader in the art, artist of the trade. If it's U.S. robot, it's perfect. The woman smiled and allowed the door to swing open slightly. "'What about amalgamated androids?' she asked. "'I understand they've got some pretty good models, too.' "'Well,' Ira admitted, "'some of the models are pretty good. "'Adequate, perhaps? "'But why take anything but the best? "'And, of course, our robots?' "'I've seen some AA models that are perfect,' the woman said. "'A suggestion of a smile tugged at the corner of her mouth. "'How can yours be any better than perfect?' Iris' voice took on a confidential complexion. "'Some of their models are beautiful,' he conceded, "'and they may seem to work well when they're new, "'but they're not built to last like ours. "'Why?' "'I think,' the woman tried to interrupt, "'that some of—' "'How can you compare them to U.S. Robot?' Ira ran on. "'We have had forty-seven years of experience "'in producing mechanicals for the most difficult jobs imaginable.' Amalgamated androids, while producing an adequate household model, does not have the valuable know-how to build into their mechanicals the strength and quality that is taken for granted in every machine bearing the U.S. robot label. The woman was sceptical. "'Maybe your company does make the best factory hands,' she argued. "'But household robots must be aesthetic as well as rugged, "'and amalgamated androids are specialists in building humanoid robots, "'while your company—' "'But, madam—' Ira said, grinning. Our household models are perfectly human in appearance. I should say, imperfectly human, because we even give them tiny blemishes to make them seem more natural. The woman was obviously unconvinced. Ira applied this clincher. What greater proof would you want than this? He held up his left hand, baring his wrist, so that she could read his identification stamp. Model 1. M.A.S.C. Serial number 27146, 12V, U.S. Robot Company, Incorporated. The woman's eyes widened. Her face took on an expression of delighted surprise. 
"'What better proof would you want?' Ira repeated. "'Do I look like a robot? Am I not a perfect humanoid? Here,' he said, extending his hand, "'feel my skin and see if it isn't just like a man's.' The woman gingerly touched his hand. Her eyes mirrored her satisfaction. Ira pressed his advantage. Model 1 robots come in both masculine and feminine designs, built to your individual specifications as to size, colouring, strength, personality, traits, apparent age, and so forth. For example, lonely people can have companionship built in. If they like, you can have an Ira or Ina's possessing an almost human intelligence and free choice, or you can get one that is blindly servile and which will never volunteer advice or information. You can get an elderly, refined butler, or a handsome young man around the house. You can get a pretty, petite parlour-maid, or a buxom cook. Ira paused to observe his customer. She was looking at him in a peculiar way. Knowing that he was a robot, she seemed to be appraising him as he would a man. Ira noted her odd reaction and puzzled over it. It usually went the other way. Women lost interest in him when they learned that he was not a man. "'Why don't you come inside?' the woman suggested suddenly, opening the door for him. Ira smiled at her graciously and went into the house. Her reaction was not so puzzling after all, he decided. A young and virtuous wife would feel the conventional fears that were built into her by society. She had to be careful. It was conceivably dangerous to be alone in the house with a handsome man. But if he's a robot, she has nothing to fear. From him or herself. "'Sit down,' the woman said, "'and rest a while.' "'Thank you, madam,' he sat. "'But, of course, I don't need the rest. Model ones can do strenuous work for twenty-three out of every twenty-four hours. In fact, in laboratory tests, they've been run for one hundred and eighty-six hours continuously, without a breakdown.' He was back in his sales pitch. "'Work is the basic function of all U.S. robot company robots.' With all their aesthetic perfection, the household models are no exception to this rule. They are unequalled in efficient performance. Power is the keynote of the Model 1. He opened his demonstration case and removed a steel bar, three inches in diameter. Placing one hand on each end, he bent the metal into a V. The heart of the mechanism, he went on, is a powerful 12-volt A battery, perfectly shielded and guaranteed to give trouble-free service for at least forty years. Sixteen motor centres are fed by the central power plant, all coordinated and synchronised by the best fluid electronic brain ever devised. Sturdy TS steel alloy construction over all gives the Model 1 its phenomenal strength and durability. And the surface tissue, made of new patented miracle material, combines the best features of aesthetic and functional performance. The woman was obviously impressed, lips slightly parted. She watched Ira attentively and listened breathlessly to everything he said. Instinctively, he felt that he had made a sale. But the woman said nothing, only gazed at him in a way that might have been covetous, might have been adoring, or might have been merely symptomatic of hypnosis. "'May I demonstrate the one's power and versatility in practical performance?' Ira asked. Taking a silence to be consent, he swung into his demonstration. Swiftly, surely, he went about the room cleaning. Effortlessly, he lifted large pieces of furniture, and holding them aloft with his right hand, he cleaned under them with his left. He talked as he worked. Notice the quiet efficiency of the self-cleansing electrostatic duster we have built in. We also have attachments for waxing, washing, spraying, painting, ironing, soldering. You're wonderful, the woman sighed. And, let me point out, Ira pursued, eager to clinch the sale, that the Model 1 is so lifelike that, in normal operation, is almost completely silent. Only a faint throbbing, like that of a human heart, is noticeable. The woman cocked her head to her side. "'I don't hear anything,' she said. Ira smiled triumphantly. "'Of course you don't. Come here,' he said. "'Put your ear to my chest, and you'll just be able to make it out.' She rested her head on his chest and listened. The delicate fragrance of her perfume mingled with that sweet human scent that not even the Model 1 robots could imitate. 
Ira bent his head and brushed his sensitized cheek against her hair. He felt emotions that no robot should feel. He silently cursed his makers and the wonderfully human brain they had given him. Their theory was that a salesman, to be effective, should think exactly like a human being. To better satisfy the customers, he should appreciate every human drive and desire. But it was wrong to feel like a man, to desire like a man, to hurt like a man, and be unable to ease the pain because he was not a man. For once, U.S. Robot had gone too far. The woman looked up at him with eyes that broadcast adoration. "'You're wonderful,' she repeated. "'Do you think?' she hesitated, looked away. "'Could I be in love with you?' she asked with childlike innocence. "'Is it possible?' Ira felt flustered, giddy, light-headed, exultant, confused, miserable, and weak. "'Damn U.S. robot and their perfected fluey electronics!' "'But, madam,' he protested, "'I'm not a man. I'm only a—' "'Please call me Emma,' the woman said. "'You see, I'm not Mrs. Bartlett. I've tried to tell you. Madam is not at home. I only work here.' Gone was his exultant feeling, gone the light-headedness. Only the misery and weakness remained in the realization that his yearning was impossible of fulfillment, and that, to top it off, he had wasted his time trying to sell himself to a servant. "'Do you think I could?' the maid repeated. "'Could what?' "'Be in love with you.' "'But, miss, don't you understand? I'm not.' "'My name is Emma,' she said softly. She smiled and he fought down an overwhelming urge to touch her, to kiss her pink, inviting lips. He stood rigid. He wanted to cry out in his torment. Her hand reached out to him, and he felt her fingers touch his. Electricity tingled up his arm and through his chest. Automatically, he repeated his cursed disavowal of humanness. Vaguely, he heard his own words, sounding like an echo in his ears. I'm a robot. I know, Emma said quietly. Then she held up her right hand, revealing the identification stamp on her wrist. Model M, FIM. Serial number 61392112V, Amalgamated Androids, Inc. A moment later, the android was in his arms. He held her close, dizzy with the sensation of this new emotion with one of his own kind. Several moments later, he pushed her gently away from him. "'Pack your bag, Emma,' he said. She looked at him, starry-eyed, but quizzically. "'But my work! Madam will be furious!' "'Your bag, Emma,' he repeated. "'When our companies built us, they made us as near human as possible. Perhaps too much so. If we can work for humans, we can also live like them.' U.S. robots and amalgamated androids have just lost two employees. Your bag. Being an android, she could work faster than any human counterpart. Her bag was packed in nothing flat. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Prisoner of War by Randall Garrett Originally published in Imagination Stories of Science and Fantasy, June 1958 Narrated by Tom Trusser It was the first time a Flesso had met an Earthman face to face, and the Flesso appeared puzzled as to why the Earthman showed no fear. Martin wasn't prepared for it when the alien tractor beam grabbed his little ship. He had been in the fourth quadrant of Fless territory, threading an uneasy course through the extraterrestrials' home grounds, but he hadn't expected to be caught so suddenly or so hard. The ship stopped in mid-flight abruptly, so abruptly that Martin's head was slammed back against the rear of the seat, and for a moment he was paralysed by the shock of what had happened. But only for a moment. His toe reached out, snapped the pedal on the subspace radio, 
and an instant later the voice of Earth Central operator said, "'What is it, Martin?' "'Tell them I've been caught,' Martin said crisply. "'Tell them the Flesso patrols got me, and—' The radio went dead as the Flesso dampers got to it. Martin pulled himself forward and ran his eyes over the instrument panel. Again, the dark velvet of space, a dull grey Flesso warship was swelling in the viewplate, preparing to scoop up its prey. Martin had been caught like a fly in molasses. The odds had been against his stunt anyway. Theoretically, such a small ship as the little scout he was piloting should have been able to get through the Flesso patrols easily. But in practice, the network of spy beams stretching through the entire quadrant were efficient and near infallible defences, as Martin was discovering now. But I had lousy luck too, he thought. I wandered right up to the biggest warship in the whole damned fleet. Must have come within a light week or less. There wasn't much point in trying to break away now. Martin was trapped, thoroughly and unarguably. The little scout ship didn't carry a tenth the power he would need to break from the grasp of the big battle cruiser, and as for the scout ship's armament, it wasn't enough even to tickle the screens of a battleship like this one. Scout ships depended on speed and indetectability, and neither attribute was of much value now. Within minutes, the heavy tractor beams pulled the smaller ship into the yawning airlock of the huge Flesso cruiser. OK, Martin thought. He folded his arms, leaned back in his chair, and waited. There was nothing else he could do, until a Fles tried to enter the ship. Time passed. The little scout ship was drawn further and further into the monster Flesso ship. It was now entirely enclosed by darkness, imprisoned within the metal hull of the huge battleship of space. Sitting inside, Martin waited patiently. The Flesso had been wanting to capture an Earthman for a long time. Well, now they'd succeeded. They'd captured their first Earth ship. Suddenly, Martin's dampened communicator screen came back to life. A scaly, toad-like face appeared and Martin stared blandly at the three red-rimmed fiery eyes that confronted him. "'I see you are still alive, Earthman.' "'No thanks to you, ugly face,' Martin returned. "'I'm hungry, though. Am I going to stay for dinner, or can I leave now?' Earth and Fless had long been in communication with each other. The war had lasted for nearly five years, ever since the first treacherous Flesso sneak attack on a Terran outpost. The beings from the planet Fles were the coldest, most dangerous aliens Earth had yet encountered in its expansion to the stars. During the war, neither side had succeeded in capturing one of the other's men alive. The ravening energies of a billion-cycle space gun tore a ship completely apart, leaving no survivors. But now Martin had been captured, and he was determined to make the most of it. "'Keep your tongue,' the toad-faced Fles snarled. Do you know who I am? Santa Claus, Uncle Sam, the Wicked Witch of the North. The alien's face radiated hatred. I am Kuvikinch Nathor. Martin whistled. Kuvik, eh? He had really stumbled into a good one then. Guvek was the leader of the Flesso legions. Hello, Guvek. The pleasure is all mine. Do I have to keep looking at your face? You will surrender or die, Guvek said, ignoring the barb. Martin chuckled. OK, come and get me, ugly. He reached out and snapped off the communicator decisively. Without waiting to see what would happen next, he sprang from the control seat. The Flesser were going to expect to find him inside the little scout ship. Very well, Martin thought. That's the one place I won't be. Smiling grimly, he strapped on a pair of bulky Spalding cutter pistols and headed for the escape hatch. The aliens, he knew, would be watching the main airlock. They wouldn't be expecting a second exit, and if they were, they wouldn't know exactly where it would be. Silently, Martin dropped through the hatch at the rear of the ship. Come and get me, he thought. I'm ready. He found himself in a large metal room that measured well over a hundred feet in width and twice that in length. 
the ceiling dimly seen was farther overhead beyond any quick estimation. Crouching in the shadow of his ship, Martin watched a platoon of the loathsome Flesso bring a heavy semi-portable burner up to the airlock. The reptilian aliens were having quite a time with the weapon. There was much hissing and flicking of tails as they got it in position. Finally, they managed to train the muzzle on the door and then pressed the firing studs. A dazzling blue-white glare leapt toward the airlock door. Lovely, Martin thought, as the bright light cast fierce illumination in the giant room. An instant after the burner went into action, so did Martin. He drew his spaldings and fired. One, two, three, four. Four quick, silent spurts of flame, and four of the aliens lay dead, charred through by the noiseless, almost invisible energy of the spaldings. The unfortunate aliens had had no way of knowing where it had come from, that death that had hit four of their number in as many seconds. The burst of light from the semi-portable burner had blanketed every trace of the faint radiation from Martin's pistol. Huddling low, Martin ran for a nearby girder, taking advantage of the fact that the aliens' attentions were still directed toward the airlock of his ship. Naturally, they wouldn't notice a figure running from the rear. He took a position behind the girder and, aiming carefully, picked up four more of the aliens. He tried to put his shot just back of the oversized toad-like heads of the Flesso, though it didn't matter much where the beam landed. The result was the same. The survivors were conferring hissingly and evincing great confusion. Apparently they still thought the fire was coming from somewhere within the ship, but they were unable to figure out where. There were eight of them left. Martin picked off one of them with his ninth charge, then held fire. He had one charge left, and there there would be a thirty-second delay while the Spaldings recharged themselves. He didn't want to leave himself defenceless even for thirty seconds. He counted off ten, fifteen, twenty. One gun was charged. He raised it, ready to fire, when he heard a sudden telltale hiss from behind him. He whirled, but it was too late. A searing beam of energy cracked into him, hurtling him backwards. He clung to consciousness an instant, then blacked out as the beam shorted his neural circuits. When he awoke, Martin opened his eyes, blinked, closed them again. Ugh, he said. He felt a savage poke in the stomach. Open your eyes. Do I have to? Open them. With visible reluctance, he opened his lids and stared into the bulging, lidless eyes of none other than Guvikenk Nathor himself. The Flesso leader was even uglier than usual. Very clever, Earthman he said coldly. For that little trick you'll die, slowly, after we have extracted all the information we need from you, that is. Trick? asked Martin blankly. Yes, getting out of the ship and shooting down my men. Dear me, Martin said innocently, I thought that was the smart thing to do, in view of your hostile attitude. I didn't realize you'd be so stuffy about it, but I'm sorry that you're so stupid, you— Silence! A heavy, clawed hand smashed across his face, slamming his head to one side. The enraged alien leader turned to a henchman at his side. Get the brain probe, Captain Ignor. At once, Commander. The captain waddled over to an elaborate-looking machine near the wall and removed its translucent hood. Martin looked at it, and almost gasped. The thing was so much like the Terran model of a brain probe that only a practised eye could tell them apart. Obviously, this machine worked on the same principle as the Earth-type brain probe did, and that, Martin reflected, was not a pleasant thought. You use that for picking your teeth, Guvek. You'll find out its use soon enough, Earthman. The Flesso scowled and signalled to the captain to wheel the brain probe over. No organic brain, Martin knew, could stand up against the mental energies of a brain probe. Within seconds, it could render any person a slave to the will of whoever operated the machine. Martin clenched his jaws grimly, ready to resist anything the Flesso could throw against him. 
There was always a chance that. Your mouth will be less full of insults when they are finished with you, Earthman. Oh, you're scaring me, Guvek. We'll see. Clamp down the helmet. The cold metal descended, and the captain anchored it tightly around Martin's skull. What shall I ask first, most noble sire? Captain Ikno asked. Guvikeng Nethor smiled harshly. I am interested in knowing how it was that he deflected the death-dealing beam that shot him down. It should have killed him, but it merely knocked him out. Ask the prisoner what protection he has. Ikno threw a switch, and a low buzzing hum throbbed in the room as the brain probe's generators went to work. Martin felt a faint tingling in his skull. Then Ikno turned a dial, and the probe sank into his brain. He held his breath as the energy projectors of the brain probe wandered around in his skull, seeking to gain hold. They failed. The Flesso model wasn't attuned to earth mines, apparently. "'Why didn't the energy beam kill you?' Captain Ikno asked. "'Because it missed me,' said Martin calmly. A grin spread across Guvek's evil, toadish face. Good, he said exultantly. It missed him. But now we know that the Earthmen have no defence against our weapons. He rubbed his dry, scaly hands together. The next question, sire? Make him tell us about the defences of Earth, Guvek said. I'll be damned if I will, you bloated monstrosity. Guvek's globular eyes blinked slowly in surprise. But you're supposed to be under the power of the machine. He turned his flat, Petrachian head to glare at Captain Ikno. Turn up the power! Yes, sire. Ikno's thick claws wrenched up the dial, and a surge of power thundered through Martin's brain without leaving an impression. Feels nice, he said, like an extra special shampoo. But you wouldn't know what a shampoo is, would you? Up higher, Guvek snapped. That's as high as it goes, sire. Martin still sat there, sneering openly at the alien's attempts to read his brain. Guvek paced angrily around the seated Earthman without speaking. "'All right,' he said finally. "'Shut the machine off. Obviously, the Earthman's brain just does not respond.' There was anger and more than a touch of surprise in his voice. "'Take the brain probe away.' "'Yes, sire.' Guvek's eyes grew hard. There are, however, older and cruder ways. What do you say to torture, eh, Earthman? I'm not much in favour of it, said Martin. I can't say I care for the idea at all. Good, Guvek said. Ignore, prepare the torture. No human being likes physical torture. The idea of having hot needles slid under one's fingernails, of having one's toenails removed by pincers, or being scourged with nerve whips. None of these were pleasant thoughts. Not pleasant, perhaps, but not unbearable, so far as Martin was concerned. It hurt. Of course it hurt. But not once during the terrible ordeal did Martin either pass out or give any sign that the torture was more than he could bear. What's the matter, Guvek? Slowing down? At each taunt, the alien overlord grew uglier and angrier and as the horror went on, Guvek seemed to come more and more frantic. None of the most delicate, subtle torture devised, and the Flesser were experts at devising torture, seemed to have any effect on the Earthman. He simply sat there, grimly, stoically. "'You're boring me, Guvek,' Martin remarked as an azit-tipped auger nibbled flesh from his chest. "'But I'm willing to be cooperative. You'll notice I'm just sitting here patiently while you play with me. Very well, Guvek stormed. If that's your attitude, we'll see what can be done. Perhaps you Earthmen have no pain nerves, but at the sight of your very bodies being destroyed. I think I've had about enough of this, Martin said. Flexing his muscles, he yanked one hand free of the torture chair and ripped the auger from his chest. He hurled the acid tip drill far across the room, where it smashed against the wall. Then he pulled his other arm free when, with one final straining effort, rose from the chair and stood unbound. What? Guvek's half-whispered question was almost impossible to hear. You're free? 
Captain Ikna opened his bulging eyes even wider and flattened himself against the wall while Guvek gasped in terror. "'I'm free,' Martin said. "'I got tired of having you play with me.' He smiled cheerfully and then sprang into life as one of the projectors that lined the wall, manned by guards outside, moved just a fraction of an inch. A burst of energy from one of those projectors could kill him, but it would kill anyone or anything else. He leapt on Guvek. He sensed the acrid, nauseating odour of the alien and wrapped his legs around the Flesso's body, pitching them both to the ground. The two of them rolled over against the far wall. A quick glance told Martin that the projectors in the walls were following, but they couldn't shoot for fear of hitting Guvek. The Flesso leader squirmed in Martin's grip as he tried to get his ray pistol out of its holster. No, you don't, Martin said, and grabbed the alien's arm. Guvek grunted as Martin bent the arm upward and twisted until the ligaments creaked. No, Guvek moaned. Drop the gun, then. The alien squirmed again. Martin twisted upwards and there was a sharp crack, followed by another, the sound of the gun hitting the floor. Then something slammed against Martin's head from behind. Jerking his head aside, he crashed his fist against Guvek's temple to knock him out and reduce the opposition. Again something struck his head. This time Martin turned and grabbed a slimy wrist. It was Captain Ikna who had been trying to knock Martin out with the butt of his pistol. Martin twisted viciously at the captain's wrist, and the ray pistol clattered to the floor. Ikna screamed in agony as a burning pain raced up his arm and swung wildly at Martin with his good arm. The savage claws raked the air just above the earthman's head, and it drove in with a solid punch that made Ikna gasp. Martin followed his advantage with a smash to the face, sent the alien reeling away in pain, and in the same motion reached down and grasped one of the fallen ray pistols. He stepped over to Guvek's limp body and jabbed the pistol into the alien leader's scaly side. "'All right,' he said coldly. "'Anything more, and I'll let Guvekink Nathor have a fast burn through his guts.' There was a stunned silence for a moment. Then the pain-racked voice of Captain Ikno said, "'Don't shoot at the Earthman! Get away from those projectors!' The projector crew held fire. Martin waited tensely as Guvek moaned and stirred. Ten feet away, standing amidst the torture implements, the captain clutched his broken arm and watched the earthman with terror in his eyes and pain evident on his face. Guvek blinked, his eyes opened. He looked dazed for a moment, then focused his eyes on Martin. His right arm, the earthman noticed, was twisted horribly. Ikna, He's over there, Martin said. His arm didn't bend either, and if you move, I'll find out how resistant your innards are to a quick burn. Guvek shook his head, bewilderedly. You've got us, Earthman. But how did it happen? How could one man take over a great battleship? It was easy, Martin said. Guvek moaned and looked at his mangled arm regretfully. I don't understand, the defeated alien commander said. Why did you let us torture you if you could get away so easily? Martin smiled. I wanted to teach you a lesson, he said. Earth's been patient with your marauding for a long time, and we put up with your sneak attack on Regulus. But the time has come to tell you to stop, or we'll wipe your whole race out of the galaxy. We're tired of your tactics, Guvek, and if one man can do this to you, what can a whole army of us do? There was a long silence before Guvek spoke, and when he spoke it was the voice of a being whose pride had been completely crushed. "'If we had known,' he said weakly, swallowing, "'who knew that Earthmen were supermen? You're the first we could capture, and it was all a trick. You let us capture you, to show us what you could do.' "'Very smart, Guvek. You learn quickly.' The alien passed one hand over his face. We'll, we'll call off our offensive at once. Good. Now I'll use your radio to call Earth and tell them you're on your way to arrange peace terms. 
At Earth Military Headquarters, General James Bedford snapped off the subspace radio and grinned at the man who faced him across the table, Colonel Parnell. You heard that, Parnell? The trick worked. He got them so scared of Earthmen that they're ready to come to terms. Colonel Parnell smiled. Fine deal all round. It cost us ten billion dollars to build military advance robot number ten, not counting what we spent on the first nine failures. But it was worth it. We've saved untold numbers of lives. The general nodded. Well worth it. Martin did the job perfectly. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Imitation of Death by Lester Del Rey, originally published in Future combined with science fiction stories, May and June 1950, narrated by Tom Trusson. Max Flay's heavy jowls relaxed and he chuckled without humour as he examined the knots that bound the man at his feet. Quite impersonally, he planted the toe of his boot in Curtis's ribs, listened with a muffled grunt of pain, and decided that the gag was effective. For once, Slim had done a good job, and there was nothing wrong. It was probably unnecessary anyway, but there could be no bungling when the future of the Plutarchy was at stake. Incompetence had cost them an empire once, and there would be no third opportunity. The stupid democracy that had called themselves a world union had colonised their planets and ruled them without plan and when Mars, Venus, and the Jovian worlds had revolted and set up a planet council, all that Earth could do was to come crawling to it, begging polite permission to join what they should have owned. But that had been before practical realists had kicked out the dreamers and set up the Plutarchy under an iron discipline that could implement its plans. Now they were heading back toward their lost empire, colonising the asteroids and establishing claims that gave them a rough rule over the outlaws who had retreated there. With a council softened up by years of cautious propaganda, they were in a position to ask and receive a mandate over the scattered planetoids. It was the opening wedge, and all they needed. Once the asteroids could be given spurious independence to seek a council seat, they would be ready to strike at the Jovian worlds. With proper incidents, propaganda and quislings, plus the planetoids to separate Jupiter from Mars, there could be no question of the outcome. Earth would gain a majority of these votes, and the Council would be the basis of a new and greater Plutarchy. Flay gave the bound body of Curtis another careless kick, and went forward to the cabin, where the lanky form of his companion was hunched dourly over the controls of the little spacecraft. How's it going, Slim? So-so. Slim ejected a green stream of narcotic juice and grinned slowly. But I still say we've been crowding our luck too hard. Rot. Lay out the right moves, cover all possibilities, outmaneuver your enemies, and you don't need luck. Ever played chess? Nope, can't say I did. Played the horses on Mars, though. Time we histed an ephemeron. One do. After I bought my lucky ghost charm been in the chips ever since. Slim's grin widened, but his face remained stubbornly unconvinced. Flay chuckled. If the planetoid outlaws depended on magic, while the council visionaries spouted sentimental twaddle, so much the better for the realists. Charms don't work in politics, Slim. We have to anticipate resistance. And you saw what happened to our fine Martian councillor Curtis when he decided to expose us and ruin the mandate. Yeah, Slim's yellow teeth chewed thoughtfully on his cud. Suppose he'd stood on Mars, though. We'd have dropped hints of just the information he needed on Cirrus and trapped him there, as we did. Checkmate. Or check out. So when he don't come back, they smell a rat. And I ain't planning on being around to chew rat poison. My grandpappy killed a counsellor once. Poor grandpappy. Hey, there's the rock. There was no outward sign of life on the barren little planetoid, but as the ship came to a grinding stop in a narrow gorge, a concealing shield snapped over them, 
and a crudely painted sign blazed out in phosphorescent gaudiness on one rocky wall. Simulacra Limited, Jeremiah Greek Proprietor, a line in Greek characters. Specialist, another line in Greek characters. Flay came out of the lock first and paused while he waited for Slim to shoulder the tarpaulin covered Curtis and follow. He grinned and pointed at the Greek characters in the sign. Magician and wonder worker, specialist in imitation and mockery, he translated. I looked it up on Mars, so don't go thinking it's some kind of spell. Now if the old fool will open up. Max remembered his own preconceptions of Greeks' process, pictured various impressive-looking apparatus, which included a large tube through which some sort of lightning zigzagged, and a beautiful woman taking form from a stream of transmuted elements streaming from the top. It was nothing like such cinematic ledger domain, of course. "'Why ain't English good enough for him?' complained Slim. "'I don't go for that magic stuff, Max. We been—' but the sigma was already swinging back on his tips to reveal a passage through the rock. A little shriveled man in tattered shorts and thick-lensed glasses stood motioning them in impatiently, and the door closed silently when they obeyed his summons. They headed down a side passage toward a ramp, and the sound of busy humming. Greek threw open a door and pointed to a table where the duplicate of Councillor Curtis lay, with a duplicate Jeremiah Greek fussing over it and humming through his nose. The guide dropped to a bench and began removing his chest and inserting a fresh power pack between two terminals. Slim's mouth dropped open and his burden slipped from his back to the floor with a sodden thump while he stared from one Greek to the other and back to the first. His fingers were stretched in the ancient sign of the horns as he watched the ch changing of accumulators and his voice was hoarse and uncertain. A damned robot! Not a robot, a simulacrum, denied the owl-eyed man who must have been the original of the metal creature. I'm a mimesist, not a creator. A robot has independent life, but that's only a limited copy of my memories and habits, like this phony Curtis. And those tapes you brought me, Flay, they stink. He gestured toward the spools of the marvellous wire that could record electromagnetic waves of any type of frequency up to several million megacycles. In one corner, a stereo player was running one off, but the vision screen was fuzzy, and the voice part was a mass of gibberish. Flay scowled at it, and turned back suspiciously to Greek. Sure you know how to use them? Those were made by... By a fool who had a shield leak in his scanner! Only a few were any good. I was using pan-cyclic tape before you ever saw a stereo record. Where do you think I impress my simulacrum's memory? On a real brain? It takes miles of tape to feed the selectrons. I did the best I could, but... Here, take a look. He reached into the false Curtis's mouth and did something that made the figure sit up suddenly. Max went over and muttered into the thing's ear, but after the first few answers it lapsed into subtle silence and he swung back toward Greek. I told you Curtis had to be perfect. This wouldn't fool a Jovian. And I told you I wasn't Jehovah. I specialize in mechanical imitations, Greek answered shortly. Bum tape, bum simulacrum. If you brought me some decent reels, I'll see what I can do, though. Flay grunted and yanked the tarpaulin off the reel Curtis. At the sight, new interest appeared on Greek's face and he came over to examine the counsellor, but stopped after a cursory look had shown that the man was still alive. He nodded. That's more like it, Flay. I'll set up an encephalograph and idea form analyzer, and record directly off his mind. It's better than feeding impressions from tape anyway, though I always use an editing circuit before. OK, you'll get something of his own mother would swear was perfect. When? Depends. Narrow-band analysis would take a couple of weeks, but it'd be permanent. If I run an all-wave impressor in, the tapes will be barely affected. I can do it in ten, twelve hours, but your simulacrum will begin to fade in a week, and wash out completely in a month. Suits me, Flay decided. We don't need him more than a few days. Any place where Slim and I can catch up on our sleep while you finish. 
Greeks as double came to life at a signal, and led them down a series of rock corridors to a room that lacked nothing in comfort, then went silently out and left them alone. To Flays as a relief, Slim tested the bed in sour displeasure, pulled a blanket off and rolled up on the floor, leaving the flotation mattress unoccupied. He had as little use for such luxuries as his boss had for his presence in the same bed. Max climbed in and adjusted the speed she dial and perfect comfort with a relaxed grunt of pleasure. He had no intention of sleeping, though, while things that concerned him were going on. Three hours later he heaved out and slipped silently down the rocky halls on sponge rubber slippers, but his training had covered the stupidity of spy stereos, and there was nothing stealthy about his entry into the laboratory. Greek looked up from a maze of wires and gadget with faint surprise but no suspicion. "'Couldn't sleep,' Flay volunteered apologetically. "'I was wondering if you had any barbiturates.' A few minutes later he took the tablet from Greeks's double, and turned back down the hallway with a muttered thanks. He had learned all he wanted to know. Both Greeks and Curtises were present and accounted for where they belonged, and the mimesist was busy about his work. There was no funny business involved. Actually, he had expected none, but it never did any harm to make sure of such things when dealing with men who were outside the law of either the Plutarchy or the Council. Slim was snoring and kicking about on the floor when he returned, and he grinned as he plopped back onto the mattress. The outlaws were useful enough now, but once Earth took over the mandate, something would have to be done about them. Too many were the wrong sort to fit into the Plutarchy. Flay stretched with a self-satisfied yawn and slipped into well-earned sleep. Greek's simulacrum wakened them in the morning and led them back to the laboratory where the scientist was waiting beside the imitation Curtis. The real counsellor must have been drugged, for he lay unconscious on one of the tables. Flay wasted only a casual glance at him, and then turned to the new simulacrum as Greek flipped it on. This time his tests were longer, and there were no sullen silences from the imitation. His response was quick sure and completely correct. The real Curtis could have done no better, and Flay stepped back at last and nodded his approval. He demanded a perfect simulacrum, and it had been delivered. "'You're sure it has a good strong desire to live?' he asked briefly as he fished into his bag for the little prepared relay that was ready. Greek smiled faintly. "'They all have that. They couldn't pass as normal men without it. And if your dimensions were correct, you should have no trouble installing your relay. He slipped aside the blouse to reveal a small cavity in the back of the simulacrum, with a bundle of little wires which Flay hooked into the relay. It slipped in and locked firmly. Greek unclipped the tiny switch from inside the machine's mouth. The animation within the simulacrum disappeared at once to snap back again as a switch on Flea's bag was pressed. A little circle of this pancyclic strip moved over a scanner inside the bag, sending out a complex wave, while a receiver in the simulacrum's back responded by closing the relay. Then the animation was cut off again, and came back at once on a second pressure of the switch. Attempted removal of the relay will destroy all circuits just as you ordered, Greek assured the operative. Well? Flay's face mirrored complete satisfaction. You'll get the fire emeralds, as promised. He reached into the bag and came out with a little bundle, a grin stretched across his face. It stayed there while a Greek moved forward quickly to stagger back with a chopped-off scream as the slugs poured into his face and exploded his head into a mangled mess of blood and grey tissue. For a second, the Greek double moved forward but it turned with a shriek and went down the hall at a clumsy run as Flay ripped the smoking gun from the package. He let it go. Curtis's head dissolved under a second series of slugs, and only the simulacrum of the consular was left with a laboratory with the two men. Slim closed his mouth slowly and reached for his green narcotic, but he made no protest. The other moved about, gathering up combustibles and stacking them in a corner, then setting fire to the pile. 
which take care of almost everything slim, Flayed said calmly. They headed out and down the hall toward their ship, with the imitation Curtis moving quietly along behind. Another slug from the gun destroyed the lock on the big Sigma, and they pushed through out into the rocky gorge. Nothing left to chance, and a perfect red herring to cover up Curtis's disappearance. Slim ducked into the lock and went forward to the controls. Aha! Uh -huh. Grandpappy'd sure have admired you, Max. He used to look just the same when he drilled somebody he didn't like. All set for takeoff. Forgetting anything, Slim? The outlaw looked up in puzzled surprise, while Flay shook his head and went over to the receiver. There was no sense in trying to teach the fool anything, apparently, but at least he might have learned elementary caution from his mode of life. The Plutarch operative ripped out the tape from the illegal all-wave recorder and slipped it into a playback slot while slow comprehension crossed the other's face. But everything was in order, with the usual hash of faint signals on various frequencies. There were no signs of a strong response, such as would have been made by any attempt on Greeks's part to double-cross him with a call to the outside. He set the receiver to record, and went toward the rear cabin and the simulacrum, while the ship blasted off and headed towards Mars. The false Curtis was already at a table, and groping through a bag of notes the original counsellor had carried. It looked up as Flay come in grimaced and went on organising the paper before it. The operative dropped to a chair with his familiar humorous chuckle. You realise your life is dependent on obedience, eh, Curtis? Would I have let you kill myself otherwise? The thing asked grimly. Leave that control gadget of yours where I can get it, and you'll feel the difference between my hands and mere flesh ones. But meantime... I'll cooperate, since I have no choice. I suppose you intend helping with my speech before the Council. Flay's appreciation for the peculiar genius of Greek went up several points as he assented tersely. The thing was perfect, or so nearly so that it seemed to consider itself the real man. There would be no trouble on that score. As for the control bag... He had no intention of letting that out of his hands until the simulacrum was turned off. It gestured toward the notes with a motion peculiar to Curtis. You'd only ruin anything you edited, Flay. I'm perfectly capable of writing the thing myself, and it'll sound like me. But if I'm going to give you a clean sheet and not make the whole council suspicious, I'll need more information than I have. I must have the whole picture, so I can take care of all objections without running counter to what some other councillors may know already. So, I think you'd better learn to address me as Councillor Curtis. Quite so, Councillor, Flay agreed, and this time the amusement in his laugh was genuine. Now, if you'll tell me what you know of our plans and methods, I'll fill in the blanks, but I'll want to see that speech when you're finished. It was amazing, the amount of evidence Curtis had managed to accumulate in a brief week or perhaps much of it had been in his hands before, and only needed organising against what they had let him find on Ceres. It was enough to have ruined all hopes of Earth's getting the mandate, and seriously endangering her relations with the Planet Council in addition. Flay made a mental note to press for an investigation of some of the Outland operatives as he began filling in the missing links in the other's information. Curtis took the facts down in a notebook, grim-faced and silent, checked them back, and reached for the typewriter. The first part of the speech he had meant to deliver needed but slight modification, and Flay read it over the simulacrum's shoulder as it operated the machine. Then the going grew tougher, and there were long pauses while the thing considered revising a word here or changing a paragraph there. It disregarded Flay's suggestions with the same disdain that would have been on the real counsellor's face, and the operative began to realise that it was justified. When it came to writing speeches, he was only an amateur, and this was professional work. He was beginning to regret that the thing could have had a life of only from a week to ten days when it finished. Earth could have used such a propagandist, particularly one accepted on the council as Mars's chief representative. Curtis's speeches had always been good, 
but he had never realised that the man's talents would have been equally good on propaganda. It was hard to believe that this was fiction, as he listened to the calm, assured voice running through it, apparently reciting only the simple truth, and yet colouring every word with some trick of oratory that seemed to make it glow with virtue and integrity. "'Perfect,' he commented when it was finished. He cut off the relay signal, watched the simulacrum slip to the floor, and went forward to the control cabin with a full measure of satisfaction. Earth could not fail. And already the red disk of Mars was large and close on the viewplate. Flay hadn't realised the time the writing of the speech had taken, but it did not regret a second of it as Slim began nursing the ship down through the thin atmosphere toward the solar centre. The taste of coming victory was strong in Max Flay as he waited outside the Martian house the next day, but Slim was still glum and morose. Part of that was probably due to his orders to stay out of the usual outlaw haunts on the planet where the police might have picked him up and ruined the whole plan. The rest, Flay decided, was just his natural fear of what he could not understand. The outlaw was grumbling and turning his lucky ghost charm over and over in his palms. Leaving the thing run around this way, we've been lucky, Max, but tain't reasonable to figure it'll hold. You should have let me tail him. Sure, Slim. People expect him to go around with you at his heels, no doubt. Flay spat dango seeds out of the open car window and took another bite of the cool fruit before going on. We have to let him circulate. No counsellor just back from a two-week trip would hole up before his meeting, when he had instructions to pick up any last-minute details piling in. Besides, we're not dealing with Curtis now, but with a machine, and it knows who its master is. The minute I cut the relay, or it gets ten miles away from me, no life. He spotted the simulacrum coming down the steps, and jumped out to open the car door. Slim grunted dourly pulling his chauffeur's cap further down his forehead. But he took the curt order from Curtis with no other protests and headed the big car toward the council chambers. The councillor passed over two slips of elaborate pasteboard and leaned back against the sheet. Passes for the two of you. Are you sure Slim knows what he's to do? There was a disgusted sound from the front, but Flay ignored it. He'd better... We've been over it often enough, but go ahead and make sure. The simulacrum ticked off the points with incisive authority. The council chamber was radiation-proof, and since Curtis would not be trusted with a relay signal, the success of the whole thing depended on Slim's behaviour. Max had secured a duplicate of his signal generator which the outlaw was to use outside the assembly, while Flay went inside with his and waited. The operative had developed complete confidence in the ability of the false Curtis, and he was sure of his own part. It was all up to Slim. There was no reason for him to fail, and he had always taken orders well enough before. Actually, it all went off with perfect smoothness. The guards passed him in after a careful scrutiny of his permit, and he carried the briefcase that held the generator up to the gallery and turned it on. Seconds later, the simulacrum came through the big doorway with only a slight flicker of uncertainty as the anti-radiation shield touched him and he passed from one generator to the other. Curtis walked along the aisle with a proper confidence and attention to his friends, presented his credentials for the purely perfunctory examination and turned off into one of the little council rooms. Two of the other Martian councillors followed him and passed out of Flay's field of view, but he was not worried about that. Slim came slouching down the gallery stairs and dropped into a seat beside the operative, putting the duplicate generator between his feet. Satisfied? Perfect, Flay assured him. They would reverse it going out. After that, Cursed would announce that he was leaving on a long trip to Ganymede, and they would be able to dispose of the simulacrum without any parts left to show what he was. Then Curtis came back into the main chamber. Apparently the council had been waiting for his return, for the sergeant-at-arms waved for order, and the meeting began, with almost no preliminaries. Earth brought up the subject of the mandate, 
and the head of the Venus Council began to come to his feet. But Curtis was up first, and the chair recognised him. Flay relaxed completely as the familiar words of the speech began to come to him, while the Venusians glanced about in surprise, and then began to listen. A moment later they were under the sway of his oratory. The single speech should do it, since the question had been tentatively decided in favour of Earth at her last meeting, pending Curtis's investigation. By night, the mandate should be a fait accompli, and Earth could begin moving out her mercenary legions in the squat mining freighters. Flay had a pretty good idea of who would lead them. He'd been in line for promotion for some time already, and the Plutarch had dropped hints of the outcome of success. It would be good to leave the dubious position of operative and become the legally recognised governor of the Mandate Planetoids, to settle down and begin organising his own private little plans for the Plutarch's job. Slim nudged him with a bony knee, but Flay was too wrapped in his own thoughts to bother until the other seized his elbow and hissed at him. Then he came out of his daydreams. Something was going on. The councillors were paying too careful attention, and the Earth delegation didn't look right. In a second his mind was back on the speech, and the words came to a chilling focus in the air. Found the organisation inconceivably complex, and yet the basic pattern is old, old as the barbarism that prompted it. Gentlemen, I have only my word as evidence now, but I can name names and give exact locations that will enable our planetary police to confirm every word of it before night falls on this meaning. The Plutarch of Earth, on the 20th of April, 42 years ago, gave the following orders, which I quote. Flay grabbed for Slims's generator and yanked the button savagely, but the still the damning words went on, detail piling on exact detail, while secret servicemen moved forward to cut the speaker off from the Earth delegates. Their rudeness was an open declaration that Earth was immediately severed from the Council. Max ripped out the generator, crushing the delicate tubes in his hands. He was stamping out on his own device at the same time, but the voice went on unchecked. Down on the floor, Curtis looked upwards without pausing in his detailed list of evidence, found the operative's eye and grinned. Then he resumed his normal gravity and went on. Slim's hands were trembling and fumbling over his charm. Flay practically carried him over to the aisle and dragged him along as he made his way up the infinite distance to the gallery door. Every step was made with the expectation of a shouted order from Curtis that would send the big explosive slugs tearing through him. But it did not come. Instead, there was only the quiet continuance of the speech, and Slim's hoarse prayers to the ghosts of the charm to save them. Surprisingly, the doors opened in the hands of the courteous guards, and the hall was before them, with no police in sight. Max cut Slim's babbled relief off with a crisp whisper. "'We're not out of it, you fool. Ten to one, it's cat and mouse, with us the losers.' but if we're going to make use of the tenth chance, shut up, walk, damn it, and grin. There was another flight of stairs leading down, a long hall and a second door that opened promptly and politely as they neared it. Then the main steps led down to the street. It was impossible that the simulacrum could have given no orders for their arrest, as impossible as their, the, the relay could be tampered with. But the big car waited at the curb, and there's still no police. Reaction left Slim drooling narcotic juice over the hands that were caressing and kissing the charm. Flay yanked him savagely into the car and gunned the electros. It went tearing out into the street under full power, while a wild yell of despair ripped out of the outlaw's throat. "'My ghost charm!' He was pawing frantically at the door-lock, with his face swivelled around toward the bright receding twinkle of the metal piece on the sidewalk behind. "'Max! Max!' Shut up and stay put. There must be a hundred more of those things you can buy if we get out of this. Flay freed a hand and forced the cringing fool back into the seat, where he relaxed woodenly, terror fading out to sullen despair that gradually mingled with doubt. Then let's get out of quick, Max. Once we hit Earth, I know a guy's got another. 
Tain't as good a ghost with it as mine, but it ain't no fake, neither. You've got to give me enough to get it, Max. Flay hid his thin grin from the other. They'd need more than a ghost charm or even planning if they ever went to Earth. He'd seen what happened to failures there, and he knew that it would be better to walk into the nearest planet police bureau. But he reached over soothingly and patted the outlaw's shoulder. Sure, Slim. We'll get you another, maybe before we leave here. It shouldn't be hard to find one of the charm peddlers and dope up a story. There was a place on Venus where they could hide, once Slim worked up his nerve to pilot them there, and provided that their luck held long enough to keep the police from impounding the little craft. But the hideout would take money, and that had to come first. Planning took care of that. He'd always been careful to avoid tying his personal fortune up in the Earth operative strongholds. He swung the car around a corner, glanced up at a jeweller's sign, and cursed without slowing down. The red light was on, warning that it had been raided, one of his secret quarters gone. He stopped obediently for a through highway, and roared on. But the second was no better— there was sweat on his forehead, and his hands were slippery with it when he headed out Mars Centre Canal into the suburbs. Damn Curtis! It was impossible for him to have found the hideout, or should have been. But there was no warning light in the window of the third and last place. The lawyer's faded sign swung into the thin wind, and everything was serenely peaceful. Flay jerked Slim out of the car, set his automatic chauffeur, and let it go rolling off. Then he moved up the steps with the outlaw at his heels, listened cautiously at the door, and nodded. The steady click of a typewriter indicated that the scrawny little secretary was doing the routine office work, and Sammy must have been undisturbed. He opened the door eagerly to a louder clicking from the typewriter. Above it, Curtis looked up with an assured smile and waved the grandfather of all hand weapons at him in genial greeting. "'Come in, Max,' he said cordially. "'Like my doubles of speech?' Slim's trembling hand fumbled out automatically in the sign of the horns. He blanched mouth, worked furiously, but the words refused to come until Curtis turned to him, then jerked back, waving his fingers. "'He couldn't uh, We'd have beat him! Max, he's dead! He's a ghost!' Flazer's hand groped for him, and missed. Another apparition came into the room from the inner office. This one was a shriveled little man, with owl eyes that blinked at them out of thick lensed spectacles. Jeremiah Greek picked up a pencil with a contented grin, drew it across the bare flesh of his arm, and held the red mark that rose on the skin out toward the outlaw. "'In the flesh!' he stated. But Slim was no longer listening. Slowly, as if moved by worn-down clockworks, he slid down the wall, and his dead-faced head bent forward to meet the knees that drew upwards. There he stayed, motionless. If that scatatonic return to the fetal position is an all-time record for speed, Curtis commented with quiet interest, sit down, Max. You seem to have overestimated your companion's moral fibre, and underestimated your opponent's. Never count on luck. It takes planning to get anywhere in this universe. By the way, Jeremiah Greek is the original inventor of pan-cyclic tape. You should have checked up on him before you trusted him, and found out the way your Plutarchy gypped him out of his invention. He wasn't the sort of man who'd cooperate very well with Earth. In fact, he was the sort you could and would fake a tape for your recorder to cover up the call they put in under my code to the Martian Council. Flay moved toward the chair as the gun commanded, only half conscious of the words. He sank into a sitting position, his mind churning savagely and getting nowhere. Play along, keep your eyes open. If you let the other guy make the moves, he'll slip up somewhere. It was basic training to operatives, though there was uncertainty in even that logic now. But there was nothing else to do. Greek picked up the account. With a promise of secrecy from Councillor Curtis, and a chance to do legitimate research here, I felt quite free to drop my very doubtful loyalty to my native planet, Mr. Flay. Those two similar cry you shot were crude, and the brain and blood imitation was quite poor, I thought. But fortunately, 
You didn't investigate thoroughly. I didn't think the relay control could fail, so simply let the simulacrum collapse and took its place. Flay was forcing himself to casualness while his brain hashed over all the rules for upsetting a trap, but it returned inevitably to the basic need of stalling for time and keeping them talking. Not at all, Curtis corrected them. We were late returning, so they simply used an all-wave receiver to record your control signal on pancyclic tape, inserting it into a generator, and the simulacrum had his freedom in his pocket two minutes after you turned on your control in the council chamber. You really didn't think I'd leave my speech in the middle to chase you when I had a perfectly good double, surely? Flay's eyes darted to Slim, but there would be no help from that quarter. Not a muscle had moved since the outlaw had collapsed under the floor. He forced himself to relax deliberately. Relax. As long as he was tensed up in the chair, they'd watch him, but they'd be less cautious if he seemed to abandon hope. And he was younger and faster than they were, in spite of his fat. Greek's amused cackle broke his chain of thought. So simple a solution, Max. But of course... An involute brain would miss just that. That's fine, relax, and when you start anything, you'll be surprised to find how quickly and efficiently a couple of sentimental visionary fools can shoot. Or do you think, Councillor, that we were really such fools? I doubt it, Curtis answered, with the same hard amusement in his voice. As I see it, a reactionary is simply unable to adapt to new conditions. He's filled with a blind, stubborn dependence on the rude past and brute force is an admission of that intellectual poverty. Max, you should have studied history better. The adult-pated idealists have a peculiar habit of winning. They stood there, grinning and studying their captive with the one thing in the universe he had never encountered. Open contempt. Flay wet his lips, glancing from one to the other, and considering the hopeless distance to the door and suddenly the beginnings of an idea permeated through the hard knot of fear in his brain. They didn't believe in brute force. They wouldn't kill him without provocation, and they couldn't turn him into the police. He swung back to Curtis, and this time there was a grin on his own lips. You said you promised Mr. Greek secrecy, Councillor, not immunity, because the old law against making robots is too strong, and Simulacra could be considered robots— well, just how do you figure you can turn me over to the authorities without breaking that promise and having him strung up beside me? I never meant to turn you in, Curtis answered. And you said yourself that brute force was stupid. Quite true, it was Greek who answered this time. But the rules of justice sometimes invoke it. The penalty for treason, like that for robotry, is still death though we've abandoned most other reasons for capital punishment. Then turn me in, or kill me yourselves, and you'll find that brute force really is stupid on Mars. The police here are the best in the system, which is why I always prefer to do my little jobs elsewhere. You amateurs wouldn't have a chance, well. But he knew that he had them, and the taste of freedom in his mouth was sweet after the fear and hopelessness of their gloating power. He did not wait for an answering nod from them, but turned from his chair in calm assurance and headed for the door. Greek's voice interrupted his exit. Just a minute, Max. You really should know all your mistakes, and there's one we forgot. Never use a perfect simulacrum. It can't be perfect without thinking exactly like its original. The same mind must operate the same way. Your simulacrum was limited only by the time it could exist, and it knew that as well as knowing it was useless among real men. <laughs> so what? Flay asked jauntily and reached for the door. And so long! Steel hands grabbed him, and a pair of arms with inhuman strength picked him up and turned him around to face the two men. Curtis dropped his gun onto the table with a slow, deliberate motion, holding the struggling operative with a single hand while he stretched the other out to Jeremiah Greek. Then he turned toward the door, dragging the fat body of Flay along without effort. So when you're found dead in your house, killed by the robot you were having built in some fiendish plot against Councillor Curtis, 
I don't think the police will worry, beyond seeing that both you and the robot are thoroughly beyond repair. There was bitterness in the voice of the simulacrum, but it was resolute and determined bitterness. When the real Curtis replaced me in the council chamber, he meant to make a few days of existence as pleasant as possible. But even a limited simulacrum likes to be useful. Come along, Max. Max Flay went along. There was nothing else he could do, as a duplicate of Curtis tossed him into a small car and began driving back toward the town and the house that had been his Martian home and soon would be his tomb. He couldn't even think straight, for his head insisted on dwelling on nonsense. Slim had been right, after all, and his ghost charm had brought him luck, even after he lost it. But for the man who had refused to believe in it, there was no hope for such insane oblivion. There was simply no hope of any kind. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. All the People by R. A. Lafferty Originally published in Galaxy Magazine, April 1961 Narrated by Tom Trissel Anthony Trotz went first to the politician, Mike Delado. How many people do you know, Mr. Delado? Why the question? I am wondering just what amount of detail the mind can hold. To a degree, I know many. Ten thousand well, thirty thousand by name, probably a hundred thousand by face and to shake hands with. And what is the limit? Anthony inquired. Possibly I am the limit, the politician smiled frostily. The only limit is time, speed of cognizance and retention. I am told that the latter lessens with age. I am seventy, and it has not done so with me. Whom have I known I do not forget? And with special training could one go beyond you? I doubt if one could, much, for my own training has been quite special. Nobody has been so entirely with the people as I have. I have taken five memory courses in my time, but the tricks of all of them I had already come to on my own. I am a great believer in the commonality of mankind, and of near equal inherent ability. Yet there are some, say the one man in fifty, who in degree, if not in kind, do exceed their fellows in scope and awareness and vitality. I am that one man in fifty, and knowing people is my specialty. Could a man who specialised still more, and to the exclusion of other things, know a hundred thousand men well? It is possible, dimly. A quarter of a million? I think not. He might learn that many faces and names, but he would not know the men. Anthony went next to the philosopher, Gabriel Mindel. Mr. Mindel, how many people do you know? How no? Per se? I say, or in say? Per suam essentium, perhaps? Or do you mean ab alio? Or to know as hoc a liquid? There is a fine difference there. Or do you possibly mean to know in substantia prima? Or in the sense of comprehensive noumena? Somewhere between the latter two, how many persons do you know by name, face, and with a degree of intimacy? I have learned over the years the names of some of my colleagues, possibly a dozen of them. I am now sound on my wife's name, and have seldom stumbled over the names of my offspring, never more than momentarily. But you may have come to the wrong man for whatever you have come for. I am notoriously poor at names, faces, and persons. I have even been described— Vox forcibus hirsit, as absent-minded. Yes, you do have the reputation, but perhaps I have not come to the wrong man in seeking the theory of the thing. 
What is it that limits the comprehensive capacity of the mind of man? What will it hold? What restricts? The body. How is that? The brain, I should say, the material tie. The mind is limited by the brain. It is skull-bound. It can accumulate no more than its cranial capacity, though not one-tenth of that is ordinarily used. An unbodied mind would, in esoteric theory, be unlimited. And how in practical theory? If it is practical, a pragma, it is a thing and not a theory. Then we can have no experience with the unbodied mind, or the possibility of it. We have not discovered any area of contact, but we may entertain the possibility of it. There is no paradox there. One may rationally consider the irrational. Anthony went next to see the priest. How many people do you know? I know all of them. That has to be doubted, said Anthony after a moment. I've had twenty different stations, and when you hear five thousand confessions a year for forty years, you by no means know all about people, but you do know all people. I do not mean types, I mean persons. Oh, I know a dozen or so well, a few thousand, somewhat less. Would it be possible to know a hundred thousand people, a half million? A mentalist might know that many to recognize. I don't know the limit. But darkened man has a limit set on everything. Could a somehow emancipated man know more? The only emancipated man is the corporally dead man, and the dead man, if he attains the beatific vision, knows all other persons who have ever been since time began. All the billions? All. With the same brain? No, but with the same mind. Then wouldn't even a believer have to admit that the mind which we have now is only a token mind? Would not any connection it would have with a completely comprehensive mind be very tenuous? Would we really be the same person if so changed? It is like saying a bucket would hold the ocean if it were fulfilled, which only means filled full. How could it be the same mind? I don't know. Anthony went to see a psychologist. How many people do you know, Dr. Sherm? I could be crabby and say that I know as many as I want to, but it wouldn't be the truth. I rather like people, which is odd in my profession. What is it that you really want to know? How many people can one man know? It doesn't matter very much. People mostly overestimate the number of their acquaintances. What is it that you are trying to ask me? Could one man know everyone? Naturally not. But unnaturally, he might seem to. There is a delusion to this effect accompanied by an euphoria, and it is called— I don't want to know what it is called. Why do specialists use Latin and Greek? One part hokum, and two parts need— there's simply not being enough letters in the alphabet of exposition without them. It is as difficult to name concepts as children, and we search our brains as a new mother does. It will not do to call two children or two concepts by one name. Thank you. I doubt that this is delusion, and it is not accompanied by euphoria. Anthony had a reason for questioning the four men since— as a new thing that had come to him, he knew everybody. He knew everyone in Salt Lake City, where he had never been. He knew everybody in Jebel Shah, where the town is a little amphitheatre around the harbour, and in Batangas and Weihai. He knew the loungers around the end of the Galata Bridge in Istanbul, and the porters in Kuala Lumpur. He knew the tobacco traders in Plovdiv, and the cork cutters of Portugal. He knew the dock workers in Djibouti and the glove makers in Prague. He knew the vegetable farmers around El Centro and the muskrat trappers of Barataria Bay. He knew the three billion people of the world by name and face, 
and with a fair degree of intimacy. Yet I'm not a very intelligent man. I've been called a bungler, and they've had to reassign me three different times at the filter centre. I've seen only a few thousands of these billions of people, and it seems unusual that I should know them all. It may be a delusion, as Dr. Sherm says, but it is a heavily detailed delusion, and it is not accompanied by euphoria. I feel like green hell just thinking of it. He knew the cattle traders in Letterkenny Donegal. He knew the cane cutters of Oriente and the tree climbers of Milne Bay. He knew the people who died every minute and those who were born. There is no way out of it. I know everybody in the world. It is impossible, but it is so. And to what purpose? There aren't a handful of them I could borrow a dollar from, and I haven't a real friend in the lot. I don't know whether it came to me suddenly, but I realised it suddenly. My father was a junk dealer in Wichita, and my education is spotty. I am maladjusted, introverted, incompetent and unhappy, and I also have weak kidneys. Why would a power like this come to a man like me? The children in the streets hooted at him. Anthony had always had a healthy hatred for children and dogs, those twin harassers of the unfortunate and the maladjusted. Both run in packs, and both are cowardly attackers. And if either of them spots a weakness, he will never let it go. That his father had been a junk dealer was not reason to hoot at him. But how did the children even know about that? Did they possess some fraction of the power that had come to him lately? But he had strolled about the town for too long. He should have been at work at the filter centre. Often they were impatient with him when he wandered off from his work, and Colonel Peter Cooper was waiting for him when he came in now. "'Where have you been, Anthony?' "'Walking. I talked to four men. I mentioned no subject in the province of the filter centre.' Every subject is in the province of the filter centre, and you know that our work here is confidential. Yes, sir, but I do not understand the import of my work here. I would not be able to give out information that I do not have. A popular misconception. There are others who might understand the import of it, and be able to reconstruct it from what you tell them. How do you feel? Nervous, unwell. My tongue is furred, my kidneys. Ah, yes, there will be someone here this afternoon to fix your kidneys. I had not forgotten. Is there anything that you want to tell me? No, sir. Colonel Cooper had the habit of asking that of his workers in the manner of a mother asking a child if he wants to go to the bathroom. There was something embarrassing in his intonation. Well, he did want to tell him something— but he didn't know how to phrase it. He wanted to tell the colonel that he had newly acquired the power of knowing everyone in the world, and that he was worried how he could hold so much in his head that was not noteworthy for its capacity. But he feared ridicule more than he feared anything else, and it was a tangle of fears. But he thought he would try it a little bit on his co-workers. "'I know a man named Walter Walleroy in Galveston,' he said to Adrian. "'He drinks beer at the Gizmo Bar, and is retired. "'What is this superlative of so what?' "'But I've never been there,' said Anthony. "'And I've never been in Kalamazoo. "'I know a girl in Kalamazoo. "'Her name is Greta Harandash. "'She is home today with a cold. "'She is prone to colds.' But Adrian was a creature both uninterested and uninteresting. It is very hard to confide in one who is uninterested. "'Well, I will live with it a little while,' said Anthony. "'Or I may have to go to a doctor and see if he can give me something to make all these people go away. But if he thinks my story is a queer one, he may report me back to the centre, and I might be reclassified again.' It makes me nervous to be reclassified. So he lived with it a while, the rest of the day and the night. He should have felt better. A man had come that afternoon and fixed his kidneys. 
but there was nobody to fix his nervousness and apprehensions. And his skittishness was increased when the children hooted at him as he walked in the morning. That hated epithet. But how could they know that his father had been a dealer in used metals in a town far away? He had to confide in someone. He spoke to Wellington, who also worked in his room. I know a girl in Beirut who is just going to bed. It's evening there now, you know. That's so. Why don't they get their time straightened out? I met a girl last night that's as cute as a correlator key, and kind of shaped like one. She doesn't know yet that I work in the centre, and I'm a restricted person. I'm not going to tell her. Let her find out for herself. It was no good trying to tell things to Wellington. Wellington never listened, and then Anthony got a summons to Colonel Peter Cooper, which always increased his apprehension. Anthony, said the Colonel, I want you to tell me if you discern anything unusual. That is really your job, to report anything unusual. The other, the paper shuffling, is just something to keep your idle hands busy. Now tell me clearly if anything unusual has come to your notice. Sir, it has. And then he blurted it all out. I know everybody. I know everybody in the world. I know them in all their billions, every person. It has me worried sick. Yes, yes, Anthony. But tell me, have you noticed anything odd? It is your duty to tell me if you have. But I've just told you. In some manner, I know every person in the world. I know the people in Transvaal. I know the people in Guatemala. I know everybody. Yes, Anthony, we realise that, and it may take a little getting used to. But that isn't what I mean. Have you, besides that thing that seems out of the way to you, noticed anything unusual, anything that seems out of place, a little bit wrong? Ah, uh, besides that and your reaction to it, no, sir. Nothing else odd. I might ask, though, how odd can a thing get? But other than that, no, sir. Good, Anthony. Now remember, if you sense anything odd about anything at all, come and tell me, no matter how trivial it is. If you feel that something is just a little bit out of place, then report it at once. Do you understand that? Yes, sir but he couldn't help wondering what it might be that the colonel would consider a little bit odd. Anthony left the centre and walked. He shouldn't have. He knew that they became impatient with him when he wandered off from his work. But I have to think. I have all the people in the world in my brain, and still I am not able to think. This power should have come to someone able to take advantage of it. He went into the plugged nickel bar, but the man on duty knew him for a restricted person from the filter centre, and would not serve him. He wandered disconsolately about the city. I know the people in Omaha and those in Omsk. What queer names have the towns of the earth? I know everyone in the world, and when anyone is born or dies, and Colonel Cooper did not find it unusual, yet I am to be on the lookout for things unusual. The question rises, would I know an odd thing if I met it? And then it was that something just a little bit unusual did happen, something not quite right, a small thing. But the colonel had told him to report anything about anything, no matter how insignificant. That struck him as a little queer. It was just that with all the people in his head, and the arrivals and departures, there was a small group that was not of the pattern. Every minute hundreds left by death and arrived by birth. And now there was a small group, seven persons. They arrived into the world, but they were not born into the world. So Anthony went to tell Colonel Cooper that something had occurred to his mind that was a little bit odd. But damn the dander-headed two- and four-legged devils! There were the kids and the dogs in the street again, yipping and hooting and chanting, Tony the Tin Man, Tony the Tin Man. He longed for the day when he would see them fall like leaves out of his mind, and death take them. 
Tony the Tin Man, Tony the Tin Man. How had they known that his father was a used metal dealer? Colonel Peter Cooper was waiting for him. You surely took your time, Anthony. The reaction was registered, but it would take us hours to pinpoint its source without your help. Now then, explain as calmly as you can what you have felt or experienced. Or more to the point, where are they? No. You will have to answer me certain questions first. I haven't the time to waste, Anthony. Tell me at once what it is and where. No. There is no other way. You have to bargain with me. One does not bargain with restricted persons. Well, I will bargain till I find out just what it means that I am a restricted person. You really don't know? Well, we haven't time to fix that stubborn streak in you. Quickly, just what is it that you have to know? I have to know what a restricted person is. I have to know why the children hoot Tony the Tin Man at me. How can they know that my father was a junk dealer? You had no father. We give to each of you a sufficient store of memories and a background of a distant town. That happened to be yours, but there is no connection here. The children call you Tony the Tin Man because, like all really cruel creatures, they have an instinct for the truth that can hurt, and they will never forget it. Then I am a tin man? Well, no. Actually, only seventeen per cent metal, and less than a third of one per cent tin. You are compounded of animal, vegetable, and mineral fibre, and there was much effort given to your manufacture and programming, yet the taunt of the children is essentially true. Then... If I am only Tony the Tin Man, how can I know all the people in the world in my mind? You have no mind. In my brain, then, how can all that be in one small brain? Because your brain is not in your head, and it is not small. Come, I may as well show it to you. I've told you enough that it won't matter if you know a little more. There are few who are taken on personally conducted sightseeing tours of their own brains. You should be grateful. Gratitude seems a little tardy. They went into the barred area, down into the bowels of the main building of the centre, and they looked at the brain of Anthony Trotz, a restricted person in its special meaning. It is the largest in the world, said Colonel Cooper. How large? A little over twelve hundred cubic metres. What a brain! And it is mine? You are an adjunct to it, a runner for it, an appendage, inasmuch as you are anything at all. Colonel Cooper, how long have I been alive? You are not. How long have I been as I am now? It is three days since you were last reassigned, since you were assigned to this and that time your nervousness and apprehensions were introduced. An apprehensive unit will be more inclined to notice details just a little out of the ordinary. And what is my purpose? They were walking now back to the office work area, and Anthony had a sad feeling at leaving his brain behind him. This is a filter centre, and your purpose is to serve as a filter of sort. Every person has a slight aura around him. It is a characteristic of his, and is part of his personality and purpose. And it can be detected electrically, magnetically, even visually under special conditions. The accumulator at which we were looking, your brain, is designed to maintain contact with all the auras in the world, and to keep a running and complete data on them all. It contains a multiplicity of circuits for each of its three billion and some subjects. However, as aid to its operation, it was necessary to assign several artificial consciousnesses to it. You are one of these. The dogs and the children had found a new victim in the streets below. Anthony's heart went out to him. The purpose, continued Colonel Cooper, was to notice anything just a little bit peculiar in the auras and the persons they represent, anything at all odd in their comings and goings. 
anything like what you have come here to report to me. Like the seven persons who recently arrived in the world, and not by way of birth. Yes, we have been expecting the first of the aliens for months. We must know their area, and at once. Now tell me. What if they are not aliens at all? What if they are restricted persons like myself? Restricted persons have no aura, are not persons, and are not alive, and you would not receive knowledge of them. Then how do I know the other restricted persons here, Adrian and Wellington and such? You know them at first hand. You do not know them through the machine. Now tell me the area quickly. The centre may be a primary target. It will take the machine hours to ravel it out. Your only purpose is to serve as an intuitive shortcut. But Tin Man Tony did not speak. He only thought in his mind, more accurately in his brain, a hundred yards away. He thought in his fabricated consciousness. The area is quite near. If the Colonel was not burdened with a mind, he would be able to think more clearly. He would know that cruel children and dogs love to worry what is not human, and that all of the restricted persons are accounted for in this area. He would know that they are worrying one of the aliens in the street below, and that is the area that is right in my consciousness. I wonder if they will be better masters. He is an imposing figure, and would be able to pass for a man. And the Colonel is right. The center is a primary target. Why? I never knew you could kill a child just by pointing a finger at him like that. What opportunities I have missed! Enemy of my enemy, you are my friend. And aloud he said to the Colonel, I will not tell you. Then we'll have you apart, and get it out of you mighty quick. How quick? Ten minutes. Time enough, said Tony, for he knew them now, coming in like snow. They were arriving in the world by the hundreds, and not arriving by birth. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Let's Get Together by Isaac Asimov Originally published in Infinity, February 1957 Narrated by Tom Trussell A kind of peace had endured for a century, and people had forgotten what anything else was like. They would scarcely have known how to react had they discovered that a kind of war had finally come. Certainly, Elias Lin, chief of the Bureau of Robotics, wasn't sure how he ought to react when he finally found out. The Bureau of Robotics was headquartered in Cheyenne, in line with the century-old trend towards decentralization, and Lin stared dubiously at the young security officer from Washington who had brought the news. Elias Lin was a large man, almost charmingly homely, with pale blue eyes that bulged a bit. Men weren't usually comfortable under the stare of those eyes, but the security officer remained calm. Lin decided that his first reaction ought to be incredulity. Hell, it was incredulity. He just didn't believe it. He eased himself back in his chair and said, How certain is the information? The security officer, who had introduced himself as Ralph G. Beckenridge and had presented the credentials to match, had the softness of youth about him, full lips, plump cheeks that flushed easily, and guileless eyes. His clothing was out of line with Cheyenne, but it suited a universally air-conditioned Washington, where security, despite everything, was still centred. Breckenridge flushed and said, "'There's no doubt about it.' "'You people know all about them, I suppose,' said Lynn, and was unable to keep a trace of sarcasm out of his tone. He was not particularly aware of his use of a slightly stressed pronoun in his reference to the enemy, the equivalent of capitalization in print. 
It was a cultural habit of his generation and the one preceding. No one said the East or the Reds or the Soviets or the Russians anymore. That would have been too confusing since some of them weren't of the East, weren't Reds, Soviets and especially not Russians. It was much simpler to say we and they and much more precise. Travellers had frequently reported that they did the same in reverse. Over there they were we in the appropriate language and we were they. Scarcely anyone gave thought to such things any more. It was all quite comfortable and casual. There was no hatred even. At the beginning it had been called a cold war. Now it was only a game, almost a good-natured game, with unspoken rules and a kind of decency about it. Lynn said abruptly, Why should they want to disturb the situation? He rose and stood staring at a wall map of the world, split into two regions with faint edgings of colour. An irregular portion of the left of the map was edged in a mild green. A smaller, but just as irregular, portion of the right of the map was bordered in a washed-out pink. We and they. The map hadn't changed much in a century. The loss of Formosa and the gain of East Germany some eighty years before had been the last territorial switch of importance. There had been another change, though, that was significant enough, and that was in the colours. Two generations before, the territory had been a brooding, bloody red, ours a pure and undefiled white. Now there was a neutrality about the colours. Lynn had seen their maps, and it was the same on their side. They wouldn't do it, he said. They are doing it, said Breckenridge, and you had better accustom yourself to the fact. Of course, sir, I realise that it isn't pleasant to think that they may be that far ahead of us in robotics. His eyes remained as guileless as ever, but the hidden knife edges of the words plunged deep, and Lynn quivered at the impact. Of course, that would account for why the chief of robotics learnt of this so late, and through a security officer at that. He had lost caste in the eyes of the government. If robotics had really failed in the struggle, Lynn could expect no political mercy. Lynn said warily, Even if what you say is true, they're not far ahead of us. We could build humanoid robots. Have we, sir? Yes. As a matter of fact, we have built a few models for experimental purposes. They were doing so ten years ago. They've made ten years' progress since. Lynn was disturbed. He wondered if his incredulity concerning the whole business were really the result of wounded pride and fear for his job and reputation. He was embarrassed by the possibility that this might be so, and yet he was forced into defence. He said, Look, young man, the stalemate between them and us was never perfect in every detail, you know. They have always been ahead in one facet or another, and we in some other facet or another. If they're ahead of us right now in robotics, it's because they've placed a greater proportion of their effort into robotics than we have. And that means that some other branch of endeavour has received a greater share of our efforts than it has of theirs. It would mean we're ahead in force field research or in hyperatomics, perhaps. Lynn felt distressed at his own statement that the stalemate wasn't perfect. It was true enough, but that was the one great danger threatening the world. The world depended on the stalemate being as perfect as possible. If the small unevenness that always existed overbalanced too far in one direction or the other. Almost at the beginning of what had been the Cold War, both sides had developed thermonuclear weapons and war became unthinkable. Competition switched from the military to the economic and psychological and had stayed there ever since. But always there was the driving effort on each side to break the stalemate, to develop a parry for every possible thrust, to develop a thrust that could not be parried in time, something that would make war possible again. And that was not because either side wanted war so desperately, but because both were afraid that the other side would make the crucial discovery first. 
For a hundred years each side had kept the struggle even, and in the process peace had been maintained for a hundred years, while byproducts of the continuously intensive research force fields had been produced and solar energy and insect control and robots. Each side was making a beginning in the understanding of mentalics, which was the name given to the biochemistry and biophysics of thought. Each side has its outposts on the moon and on Mars. Mankind was advancing in giant strides under forced draft. It was even necessary for both sides to be as decent and humane as possible among themselves, lest through cruelty and tyranny friends be made for the other side. It couldn't be that the stalemate would now be broken and that would be war. Lin said, I want to consult one of my men. I want his opinion. Is he trustworthy? Lin looked disgusted. Good Lord, what man in robotics has not been investigated and cleared to death by your people? Yes, I vouch for him. If you can't trust a man like Humphrey Carl Laszlo, then we're in no position to face the kind of attack you say. They are launching, no matter what else we do. I've heard of Laszlo, said Breckenridge. Good. Does he pass? Yes. Then I'll have him in and we'll find out what he thinks about the possibility that robots could invade the USA. Not exactly, said Breckenridge, softly. You still don't accept the full truth. Find out what he thinks about the fact that robots have already invaded the USA. Laszlo was the grandson of a Hungarian who had broken through what had then been called the Iron Curtain, and he had a comfortable above-suspicion feeling about himself because of it. He was thick-set and balding, with a pugnacious look graven forever on his snub face, but his accent was clear Harvard, and he had almost excessively soft-spoken. To Lin, who was conscious that after years of administration he was no longer expert in the various phases of modern robotics, Laszlo was a comforting receptacle for complete knowledge. Lin felt better because of the man's mere presence. Lin said, What do you think? The scowl twisted Laszlo's face ferociously. That they're that far ahead of us? Completely incredible. It would mean they've produced humanoids that could not be told from humans at close quarters. It would mean a considerable advance in robo-mentalics. You're personally involved, said Breckenridge, coldly. Leaving professional pride out of account, exactly why is it impossible that they be ahead of us? Laszlo shrugged. I assure you that I'm well acquainted with their literature on robotics. I know approximately where they are. You know approximately where they want you to think they are, is what you really mean, corrected Breckenridge. Have you ever visited the other side? I haven't, said Laszlo shortly. Nor you, Dr. Lin? Lin said, no, I haven't either. Breckenridge said, has any robotics man visited the other side in twenty-five years? He asked the question with a kind of confidence that indicated he knew the answer. For a matter of seconds... The atmosphere was heavy with thought. Discomfort crossed Laszlo's broad face. He said, As a matter of fact, they haven't held any conferences on robotics in a long time. In twenty-five years, said Breckenridge, isn't that significant? Maybe, said Laszlo reluctantly. Something else bothers me, though. None of them have ever come to our conferences on robotics, none that I can remember. Were they invited? asked Breckenridge. Lynn, staring and worried, interposed quickly. Of course, Breckenridge said. Do they refuse attendance to any other types of scientific conferences we hold? I don't know, said Laszlo. He was pacing the floor now. I haven't heard of any cases. Have you, Chief? No, said Lynn. Breckenridge said, wouldn't you say it was as though they didn't want to be put in the position of having to return any such invitation, or as though they were afraid one of their men might talk too much? That was exactly how it seemed, and Lynn felt a helpless conviction that security's story was true, after all, steal over him. Why else had there been no contact between sides on robotics? 
there had been a cross-fertilizing trickle of researchers moving in both directions on a strictly one-for-one -one basis for years, dating back to the days of Eisenhower and Khrushchev. There were a great many good motives for that, an honest appreciation of the supranational character of science, impulses of friendliness that are hard to wipe out completely an individual human being, the desire to be exposed to a fresh and interesting outlook, and to have your own slightly stale notions greeted by others as fresh and interesting. The governments themselves were anxious that this continue. There was always the obvious thought that by learning all you could and telling as little as you could, your own side would gain by the exchange. But not in the case of robotics. Not there. Such a little thing to carry conviction, and a thing, moreover, they had known all along. Lynn thought darkly, we've taken the complacent way out. Because the other side had done nothing publicly on robotics, it had been tempting to sit back smugly and be comfortable in the assurance of superiority. Why hadn't it seemed possible, even likely, that they were hiding superior cards, a trump hand for the proper time? Laszlo said, shakenly, what do we do? It was obvious that the same line of thought had carried the same conviction to him. Do, parroted Lynn. It was hard to think right now of anything but of the complete horror that came with conviction. There were ten humanoid robots somewhere in the United States, each one carrying a fragment of a TC bomb. TC. The race for sheer horror in bombery had ended there. TC. Total conversion. The sun was no longer a synonym one could use. Total conversion made the sun a penny candle. Ten humanoids, each completely harmless in separation, could, by the simple act of coming together, exceed critical mass and... Lynn rose to his feet heavily. The dark pouches under his eyes, which ordinarily lent his ugly face a look of savage foreboding, more prominent than ever. It's going to be up to us to figure out ways and means of telling a humanoid from a human and then finding the humanoids. How quickly, muttered Laszlo. Not later than five minutes before they get together, barked Lynn, and I don't know when that will be. Breckenridge nodded. I'm glad you're with us now, sir. I'm to bring you back to Washington for conference, you know. Lynn raised his eyebrows. All right. He wondered if, had he delayed longer in being convinced, he might not have been replaced forthwith, if some other chief of the Bureau of Robotics might not be conferring in Washington. He suddenly wished earnestly that exactly that had come to pass. The first presidential assistant was there, the Secretary of Science, the Secretary of Security, Lynn himself, and Breckenridge, five of them sitting about a table in the dungeons of an underground fortress near Washington. Presidential assistant Jeffreys was an impressive man, handsome in a white head and just a trifle jowly fashion, solid, thoughtful, and as unobtrusive politically as a presidential assistant ought to be. He spoke incisively. There are three questions that face us as I see it. First, when are the humanoids going to get together? Second, where are they going to get together? Third, how do we stop them before they get together? Secretary of Science Amberley nodded convulsively at that. He had been Dean of Northwestern Engineering before his appointment. He was thin, sharp-featured, and noticeably edgy. His forefinger traced slow circles on the table. As far as when they'll get together, he said, I suppose it's definite that it won't be for some time. Why do you say that? asked Lynn sharply. They've been in the U.S. for at least a month already, so security says. Lynn turned automatically to look at Breckenridge, and Secretary of Security McAllister intercepted the glance. McAllister said, The information is reliable. Don't let Breckenridge's apparent youth fool you, Dr. Lynn. That's part of his value to us. Actually, he's thirty-four and has been with the department for ten years. He has been in Moscow for nearly a year, and without him, none of this terrible danger would be known to us. As it is, we have most of the details. 
Not the crucial ones, said Lynn. McAllister of security smiled frostily. His heavy chin and close-set eyes were well known to the public, but almost nothing else about him was. He said, We are all finitely human, Dr. Lynn. Agent Breckenridge has done a great deal. Presidential Assistant Jeffreys cut in. Let us say we have a certain amount of time. If action at the instant were necessary, it would have happened before this. It seems likely that they are waiting for a specific time. If we knew the place, perhaps the time would become self-evident. If they're going to TC a target, they'll want to cripple us as much as possible, so it would seem that a major city would have to be it. In any case, a major metropolis is the only target worth a TC bomb. I think there are four possibilities. Washington, as the administrative centre, New York as the financial centre, and Detroit and Pittsburgh as the two chief industrial centres. McAllister of security said, I vote for New York. Administration and industry have both been decentralised to the point where the destruction of any one particular city won't prevent instant retaliation. Then why New York? asked Amberley of science, perhaps more sharply than he intended. Finance have been decentralised as well. A question of morale. It may be they intend to destroy our will to resist, to induce surrender by the sheer horror of the first blow. The greatest destruction of human life would be in the New York metropolitan area. Pretty cold-blooded, muttered Lynn. I know, said McAllister of security, but they're capable of it. If they thought it would mean final victory at a stroke, wouldn't we? Presidential assistant Jeffreys brushed back his white hair. Let's assume the worst. Let's assume that New York will be destroyed sometime during the winter, preferably immediately after a serious blizzard when communications are at their worst and the disruption of utilities and food supplies in fringe areas will be most serious in their effect. Now, how do we stop them? Amberley of Science could only say, Finding ten men in two hundred and twenty million is an awfully small needle in an awfully large haystack. Jeffreys shook his head. You have it wrong. Ten humanoids among two hundred twenty million humans. No difference, said Amberley of Science. We don't know that a humanoid can be differentiated from a human at sight. Probably not. He looked at Lynn. They all did. Lynn said heavily, we in Cheyenne couldn't make one that would pass as human in the daylight. But they can, said McAllister of security, and not only physically, we're sure of that. They've advanced metallic procedures to the point where they can reel off the microelectronic pattern of the brain and focus it on the positronic pathways of the robot. Lynn stared. Are you implying that they can create the replica of a human being complete with personality and memory? I do. Of specific human beings? That's right. Is this also based on Agent Breckenridge's findings? Yes, the evidence can't be disputed. Lynn bent his head in thought for a moment. Then he said, Then ten men in the United States are not men but humanoids. But the originals would have had to be available to them. They couldn't be Orientals, who would be too easy to spot so they would have to be East Europeans. How would they be introduced into this country, then? With a radar network over the entire world border as tight as a drum, how could they introduce any individual, human or humanoid, without our knowing it? McAllister of security said, It can be done. There are certain legitimate seepages across the border. Businessmen, pilots, even tourists. They are watched, of course, on both sides. Still... Ten of them might have been kidnapped and used as models for humanoids. The humanoids would then be sent back in their place. Since we wouldn't expect such a substitution, it would pass us by. If they were Americans to begin with, there would be no difficulty in their getting into this country. It's as simple as that. And even their friends and family could not tell the difference. We must assume so. Believe me, we have been waiting for any report that might imply sudden attacks of amnesia or troublesome changes in personality. We have checked on thousands. Amberley of Science stared at his fingertips. I think ordinary measures won't work. The attack must come from the Bureau of Robotics, and I depend on the chief of that bureau. 
Again, eyes turned sharply, expectantly, on Lynn. Lynn felt bitterness rise. It seemed to him that this was what the conference came to and was intended for. Nothing that had been said had not been said before. He was sure of that. There was no solution to the problem, no pregnant suggestion. It was a device for the record, a device on the part of men who gravely feared defeat and who wished the responsibility for it placed clearly and unequivocally on someone else. And yet there was justice in it. It was in robotics that we had fallen short, and Lynn was not Lynn merely, he was Lynn of robotics, and the responsibility had to be his. He said, I will do what I can. He spent a wakeful night, and there was a haggardness about both body and soul when he sought and attained another interview with Presidential Assistant Jeffreys the next morning. Breckenridge was there, and though Lynn would have preferred a private conference, he could see the justice in the situation. It was obvious that Breckenridge had attained enormous influence with the government as a result of his successful intelligence work. Well, why not? Lynn said, Sir, I am considering the possibility that we are hopping uselessly to enemy piping. In what way? I am sure that however impatient the public may grow at times, and however legislators sometimes find it expedient to talk, the government at least recognises the world stalemate to be beneficial. They must recognise it also. Ten humanoids with one TC bomb is a trivial way of breaking the stalemate. The destruction of fifteen million human beings is scarcely trivial. It is from the world power standpoint. It would not so demoralise us as to make us surrender or to cripple us or so cripple us as to convince us that we could not win. There would just be the same old planetary death war that both sides have avoided so long and so successfully. And all they would have accomplished is to force us to fight minus one city. It's not enough. What do you suggest? said Jeffreys coldly. That they do not have ten humanoids in our country? That there is not a TC bomb waiting to get together? I'll agree that those things are here but perhaps for some reason greater than just midwinter bomb madness. Such as? It may be that the physical destruction resulting from the humanoids getting together is not the worst thing that can happen to us. What about the moral and intellectual destruction that comes with their being here at all? With all due respect to Agent Breckenridge, what if they intended for us to find out about the humanoids? What if the humanoids are never supposed to get together, but merely to remain separate in order to give us something to worry about? Why? Tell me this. What measures have already been taken against the humanoids? I suppose that security is going through the files of all citizens who have ever been across the border or close enough to it to make kidnapping possible. I know, since McAllister mentioned it yesterday, that they are following up suspicious psychiatric cases. What else? Jeffreys said. Small X-ray devices are being installed in key places in large cities, in the mass arenas, for instance, where ten humanoids might slip in among a hundred thousand spectators of a football game or an air polo match. Exactly. And concert halls and churches. We must start somewhere. We can't do it all at once. Particularly when panic must be avoided, said Lynn. Isn't that so? It wouldn't do to have the public realise that at any unpredictable moment some unpredictable city and its human contents would suddenly cease to exist. I suppose that's obvious. What are you driving at? Lynn said strenuously. That a growing fraction of our national effort will be diverted entirely into the nasty problem of what Amberley called finding a very small needle in a very large haystack. We'll be chasing our tails madly while well, they increase their research lead to the point where we find we can no longer catch up, when we must surrender without the chance even of snapping our fingers in retaliation. Consider further that this news will leak out as more and more people become involved in our countermeasures and more and more people begin to guess what we are doing. Then what? The panic might do us more harm than any one TC bomb. The presidential assistant said irritably, 
"'In heaven's name, man, what do you suggest we do, then?' "'Nothing,' said Lynn. "'Call their bluff. "'Live as we have lived, and gamble that they won't dare break the stalemate "'for the sake of a one-bomb head-start.' "'Impossible!' said Jeffreys. "'Completely impossible. "'The welfare of all of us is very largely in my hands, "'and doing nothing is the one thing I cannot do. "'I agree with you, perhaps, that X-ray machines at sports arenas "'are a kind of skin-deep measure that won't be effective, "'but it has to be done so that people, in the aftermath, "'do not come to the bitter conclusion that we tossed our country away "'for the sake of a subtle line of reasoning that encouraged do-nothingism.' In fact, our counter-gambit will be active indeed. In what way? Presidential Assistant Jeffreys looked at Breckenridge. The young security officer, hitherto calmly silent, said, It's no use talking about a possible future break in the stalemate when the stalemate is broken now. It doesn't matter whether these humanoids explode or do not. Maybe they are only a bait to divert us, as you say. But the fact remains that we are a quarter of a century behind in robotics, and that may be fatal. What other advances in robotics will there be to surprise us if war does start? The only answer is to divert our entire force immediately, now, into a crash program of robotics research, and the first problem is to find the humanoids. Call it an exercise in robotics, if you will, or call it the prevention of the death of fifteen million men, women and children. Lynn shook his head helplessly. "'You can't. You'll be playing into their hands. They want us lured into the one blind alley while they're free to advance in all other directions.' Jeffreys said impatiently, "'That's your guess. Breckenridge has made his suggestion through channels and the government has approved, and we will begin with an all-science conference.' "'All science?' Breckenridge said, we have listed every important scientist of every branch of natural science. They'll all be at Cheyenne. There will be only one point on the agenda, how to advance robotics. The major specific subheading under that will be how to develop a receiving device for the electromagnetic fields of the cerebral cortex that will be sufficiently delicate to distinguish between a protoplasmic human brain and a positronic humanoid brain. Jeffreys said, We had hoped you would be willing to be in charge of the conference. I was not consulted in this. Obviously time was short, sir. Do you agree to be in charge? Lynn smiled briefly. It was a matter of responsibility again. The responsibility must be clearly that of Lynn of robotics. He had the feeling it would be Breckenridge who would really be in charge. But what could he do? He said, I agree. Breckenridge and Lynn returned together to Cheyenne, where the evening Laszlo listened with a sullen mistrust to Lynn's description of coming events. Laszlo said, "'While you were gone, Chief, I've started putting five experimental models of humanoid structure through the testing procedures. Our men are on a twelve-hour day, with three shifts over overlapping. If we've got to arrange a conference, we're going to be crowded and red-taped out of everything. Work will come to a halt.' Breckenridge said, that will be only temporary. You will gain more than you lose. Laszlo scowled. A bunch of astrophysicists and geochemists were around won't help a dam toward robotics. Views from specialists of other fields may be helpful. Are you sure? How do we know that there is any way of detecting brain waves, or that, even if we can, there is a way of differentiating human and humanoid by wave pattern? Who set up the project anyway? I did, said Breckenridge. You did? Are you a robotics man? The young security agent said calmly. I have studied robotics. That's not the same thing. I've had access to text material dealing with Russian robotics, in Russian. Top secret material well in advance of anything you have here. Lynn said ruefully, He has us there, Laszlo. It was on the basis of that material, Breckenridge went on, that I suggested this particular line of investigation. It is reasonably certain that in copying off the electromagnetic pattern of a specific human mind into a specific positronic brain, a perfectly exact duplicate cannot be made. For one thing, the most complicated positronic brain, small enough to fit into a human-sized skull, is hundreds of times less complex than the human brain. 
It can't pick up all the overtones, therefore, and there must be some way to take advantage of that fact. Laszlo looked impressed despite himself, and Lynn smiled grimly. It was easy to resent Breckenridge and the coming intrusion of several hundred scientists of non-robotic specialties, but the problem itself was an intriguing one. There was that consolation, at least. It came to him quietly. Lynn found he had nothing to do but sit in his office alone, with an executive position that had grown merely titular. Perhaps that helped. It gave him time to think, to picture the creative scientists of half the world converging on Cheyenne. It was Breckenridge who, with cool efficiency, was handling the details of preparation. There had been a kind of confidence in the way he said, Let's get together, and we'll lick them. Let's get together. It came to Lin so quietly that anyone watching Lin at that moment might have seen his eyes blink slowly twice, but surely nothing more. He did what he had to do, with a whirling detachment that kept him calm when he felt that, by all rights, he ought to be going mad. He sought out Breckenridge in the other's improvised quarters. Breckenridge was alone and frowning. "'Is anything wrong, sir?' Lin said, wearily. Everything's right, I think. I've invoked martial law. What? As chief of a division, I can do so if I am of the opinion the situation warrants it. Over my division, I can then be dictator. Chalk up one for the beauties of decentralization. You will rescind that order immediately. Breckenridge took a step forward. When Washington hears this, you'll be ruined. I'm ruined anyway. Do you think I don't realise that I've been set up for the role of the greatest villain in American history, the man who let them break the stalemate? I have nothing to lose, and perhaps a great deal to gain. He laughed a little wildly. What a target the division of robotics will be, eh, Breckenridge? Only a few thousand men to be killed by a TC bomb capable of wiping out three hundred square miles in one microsecond. But five hundred of those men would be our greatest scientists. We would be in the peculiar position of having to fight a war with our brains shot out, or surrendering. I think we'd surrender. But this is impossible, Lynn. Do you hear me? Do you understand? How could the humanoids pass our security provisions? How could they get together? But they are getting together. We're helping them to do so. We're ordering them to do so. Our scientists visit the other side, Breckenridge. They visit them regularly. You made a point of how strange it was that no one in robotics did. Well, ten of those scientists are still there, and in their place ten humanoids are converging on Cheyenne. That's a ridiculous guess. I think it's a good one, Breckenridge. But it wouldn't work unless we knew humanoids were in America, so that we would call the conference in the first place. Quite a coincidence that you brought the news of the humanoids and suggested the conference and suggested the agenda and are running the show and know exactly which scientists were invited. Did you make sure the right ten were included? Dr. Lynn cried Breckenridge in outrage. He poised to rush forward. Lynn said, don't move. I've got a blaster here. We'll just wait for the scientists to get here one by one. One by one we'll x-ray them. One by one we'll monitor them for radioactivity. No two will get together without being checked. And if all five hundred are clear, I'll give you my blaster and surrender to you. Only I think we'll find the ten humanoids. Sit down, Breckenridge. They both sat. Lynn said, We wait. When I'm tired, Laszlo will spell me. We wait. Professor Manuelo Jimenez of the Institute of Higher Studies of Buenos Aires exploded while the stratospheric jet on which they travelled on was three miles above the Amazon valley. It was a simple chemical explosion, but it was enough to destroy the plane. Dr. Herman Liebowitz of MIT exploded in a monorail, killing twenty people and injuring a hundred others. In similar manner, Dr. Auguste Marin of l'Institut Nucléonique of Montreal and seven others died at various stages of their journey to Cheyenne. Laszlo hurtled in, pale-faced and stammering, with the first news of it. It had only been two hours that Lynn had sat there, facing Breckenridge, blaster in hand. Laszlo said, 
I thought you were nuts, Chief, but you were right. They were humanoids. They had to be. He turned to stare with hate-filled eyes at Breckenridge. Only they were warned. He warned them. And now there won't be one left intact, not one to study. God, cried Lynn, and in a frenzy of haste thrust his blaster out toward Breckenridge and fired. The security man's neck vanished. The torso fell. The head dropped, thudded against the floor, and rolled crookedly. Lynn moaned. I didn't understand. I thought he was a traitor. Nothing more. And Laszlo stood immobile, mouth open, for the moment incapable of speech. Lynn said wildly, Sure, he warned them. But how could he do so while sitting in that chair unless he were equipped with a built-in radio transmission? Don't you see it? Breckenridge had been in Moscow. The real Breckenridge is still there. Oh, my God, there were eleven of them. Laszlo managed a hoarse squeak. Why didn't he explode? He was hanging on, I suppose, to make sure the others had received his message and were safely destroyed. Lord, Lord, when you brought the news and I realised the truth, I couldn't shoot fast enough. God knows by how few seconds I may have beaten him to it. Laszlo said shakily, At least we'll have one to study. He bent and put his fingers on the sticky fluid trickling out of the mangled remains at the neck end of the headless body. Not blood, but high-grade machine oil. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past to infinity and beyond.